At the Abraham Lincoln Bookshop, if it's on our shelves, it's history. Were there major differences in the foods that Lincoln ate from Kentucky to Indiana to Illinois to Washington, D.C.? What were the changes that he saw in, his, in what he was ingesting? It's, it's an, in, an increased supply of different kinds of foods as you make that journey. It's also an increased diversity and sophistication. So when you're in Kentucky, about which not much has been written, but certainly when you're in Indiana, where we had all of those wonderful reminiscences that um, William Herndon was able to capture, his neighbors are talking about the, the essentials of breaking the land and pioneering farming. So you have kind of the initial crops of corn, sharing a field with pumpkins and beans, because the beans can climb the corn, the pumpkins you plant in among them, and one of his Lincoln's memories is that when he was young and in Kentucky, he helped his father plant and every plant corn and every so often, so often hills, he would plant a pumpkin seed, but then a flood came and washed that all out. So you know that, that Lincoln is recalling that his father is planting a shared field. So the pumpkins spread around and shade to keep the weeds down. So you have this, this combo field, if you will, with three cops, crops at once. But as they, the trade began to come into the more sophisticated Indiana community of Gentryville, you begin to see you know, more things becoming available. You begin to see them growing wheat for flour as opposed to just relying on cornmeal as the grain that you would make a cake out of. There's a, a cake in the book which I call a Tennessee cake because I found the recipe in a Tennessee agricultural journal. And it's, it's essentially all cornmeal and it's a, a very nice cake, but it's not what we think of as something sweet and you know party like you know dennis hanks recalled you know we had some sum wheat for cake <laughs> so it was a very it was a rarity but then as you get into illinois and you begin to get into new salem and you look at certainly the recipes that i found in that that newspaper from the 1830s there's there's wheat flowers common thing to use to in baked goods and you see um then as you get into springfield when you look at the grocery lists of what's of you know the Here's what we have in store today from all of the grocery stores. You see much more sophisticated ingredients, and even those grocery store ads changed. In the beginning, um, in the 1840s, you see a lot of mention of salt, because this is the essential ingredient for those who are living on the farms, because it's a much more farm community than with 2,600 people or so. So people are coming into town to buy salt so they can put down their own hams, they can put down their own pickled pork. Uh, they can salt down what they need to salt down to preserve it. By the time you get into the 1850s, you really don't see you know bulk purchases of salt advertised as a possibility in the newspapers. It's much more sophisticated ingredients. You see things like red gelatin, which was another thing that surprised me, that there was essentially colored jello available in the Springfield markets, mm. as opposed to having to get you know, eyes and glass and color it with, you know, Coach Neal or something. They're advertising pre-colored gelatin, which was an incredibly sophisticated and narrow niche market. So it was just, you know, fascinating. You know, the, when Springfield, Illinois, wanted to renovate the old state capital, and which they did, and it's gorgeous. If you've never been there, you've got to get there. Uh, it's a wonderful building. But they... They didn't know how to furnish it because the furnishings came up the Mississippi from New Orleans and had more of a French style than would have come maybe from the East if they could have gotten anything. So more, most of it came up there and they were lucky enough to find a warehouse of just the furniture that they needed from the day. Now, foods too, I presume, came a great deal up the Mississippi, maybe with a different flavor than they would have from the East. But then the railroads come in oh, and yes. you talk about yeah. that. So does that help that sophistication and change the taste? It sure brings a heck of a lot of oysters to Springfield. Mm. <laughs> you, you see, all, it, it's fascinating. The oysters then, I think, were Christmas food they, the way they are in a lot of cultures here. So in December, you begin to see all of these newspaper grocery store ads saying, we have oysters. And they start out at a certain price point, and as December goes along, the price point begins to drop because I think they have a surplus. 
But you begin to see, you know, not only oysters, but you see other kinds of dried and canned fish. Uh, and the ads are saying, you know, these are coming from Baltimore or we're getting oranges from Florida. So the ads are saying the provenance of the food. So not only is it a sophisticated food that they're bringing in or a diverse food they're bringing in, they're telling you as a, a guarantee of its goodness where it's coming from. When they got to Washington, D.C., not only in 1848, maybe that's a little bit different than 12 years later, mm -hmm. 13 years later in 1861, when they got there for the presidency, did they find different foods out there that they, that they had not encountered before? Well, it's hard to say what they could encounter and what they couldn't encounter because Springfield, again, was having these restaurants that were advertising French mm -hmm. Frenchified food, you know, Gallo-American is, is one term that's used during the period. And certainly, um, I live in St. Paul, and if you look at the historic records and the historic menus from St. Paul Society in the 1850s, and St. Paul was, you know, right on the edge of the settled nation, if you're moving straight across, um, you know, we're eating Gallo-American food, you know, in St. Paul as well. But I think the pressure in the East, the pressure to entertain in the White House is a little more sophisticated when you're entertaining congressmen and senators who have an expectation of an elevated kind of entertainment. So of course there's the, the famous dinner that Mary gave in 1862 where she's you know, roundly criticized for making this very fancy menu prepared by an imported French chef from New York. And when you read what they read on the journey to get to the White House before he's inaugurated, you see, you know, state, city after city where they give a menu, and there really is only in New York where they get the full menu. It is the full out Gallo American, you know, fancy, fancy kind of food. Mm. Well, um, when I was first courting my wife, she told me very early on, I'm a lover, not a cook. <laughs> and I'm wondering about this about Mary, because in Lexington, as you mentioned in the book, she didn't really have to do cooking, and uh, she maybe wasn't as familiar in the kitchen, and didn't maybe get sophisticated tastes, I don't know. How did she evolve through Springfield and into Washington? Could she help in the kitchen in Washington and know what to do. I, I think they would have shooed her out of the kitchen in Washington. There were, there were a series of cooks, and it's hard to pin down exactly who was cooking. And my sense of it is, though it is a singular cook, usually a woman, um, primarily a woman. I can't think of a man's name I saw as listed as a cook. But she says in the White House, she's writing to one of her friends, she said, this is a wonderful place to live. All you have to do is ask for what you want and they bring it to you. <laughs> but she cooked in Springfield and she was known to be a good cook, as were her sisters, who also lived in Springfield. And she, I think it's a, a measure of how much she cared about Mr. Lincoln that she really learned how to do something which was foreign to her. Um, you know, she's cooking on the open hearth. Later she gets the stove, the Royal Oak Number no. 9 stove, and there's one story that suggests that she loved it so much she wanted to take it with her to the White House mm. without understanding how the whole White House worked. Yeah. Um, but there are all these, you know, there's these reminiscences of when the children in the neighborhood came to play with the Lincoln boys. Um, you know, Willie and Willie and Tad at that point, because Robert's in school, you know, she always had something for the children to eat. And if you look at the, the kitchen, which is kind of a small, narrow room across the back of the house, it has two doors. Then the dining room is forward of it. There's a door into the dining room, of course, from the kitchen. And then the window on the side is one of those great windows which can raise from the bottom. So you have three ways and for kids to come careening through that kitchen. And I think that must have been what the life was like because you read, you know, about the children and the playmates and about Fido the dog who mm. apparently when they left him with the Roll family because they couldn't take him with them to the White House, they left instructions that the dog was to be treated the way he'd been treated in their home 
which was to be allowed to wander around the dining room table and be fed table scraps. <laughs> so the dog was totally spoiled, and if they spoiled the dog, and rumor, you know, the stories are that Lincoln and Mary denied their boys nothing. I just imagine this joyful place full of great treats for kids and kids running in and out, tripping yeah. over dogs and cats. And kids and dogs going for the same scraps. Exactly right. You know, this is a wonderful book that you're going to find so much in here. We're not done yet. Uh, with Abraham Lincoln in the Kitchen, a culinary view of Lincoln's life and times. And I think you'll enjoy this book for on many different levels, not just the recipes, but the background uh, uh, to American food of the day, and also, for that matter, how to try to prepare something that is as close as possible to the 19th century when you want to do that on, on an anniversary. And I think as a, uh, a duo, uh, Wayne Temple's The Taste Is In My Mouth, Lincoln's Victuals and Potables, is a wonderful book. The thing I, I love the most about it, actually, is this register that he has. He has a large register of all the foods mm -hmm. Lincoln, all the foods and beverages that Lincoln ingested, and uh, talks about wh where they came from and all, and uh, it's just really fun to see where he, f Wayne, found what Lincoln ate. Of course, uh, apples, as we talked mm -hmm. about, are number one, mm -hmm. I suppose. And John from Kendall Park, New Jersey, asked this, what type of apples would Lincoln have eaten? If there were different types, which was his favorite, if you know? I don't know, but I think he would have... I know that in the front yard of their home in Springfield, they were... The, the, the landscape architect research has shown that they raised some kind of an early greening kind of apple. So they had an early... Uh, fall apple there. Um, certainly they would have been smaller just because fruits back then were smaller typically. They wouldn't have been like a, a, you know a red delicious apple. They would have been smaller and more flavorful. You know what you would find I would imagine at a heritage um, apple nursery today. Um, we talked about jumbles and we talked about gingerbread man. Uh, what are bacon braised chicken? What is that like? And that's the recipe is in here. Uh, well, that was another interesting adventure in, in my cooking exploration. Um, I chose to write about the Black Hawk War and Lincoln's experience as being a soldier in the Black Hawk War because I found it just really intriguing and something that is not written about too much in kind of the typical biographies which um, tend to be weighted more to the political side. And so George Harrison, I, George another Harrison, George Harrison, that not, not had the, wonderful letters that helped you with this. George Harrison was just a wonderful man who again wrote into Herndon and described he, he his, was, he was, he was Lincoln his, in Lincoln's... He was in Lincoln's company. Okay. And the two of them are tramping around northern Illinois and southern Wisconsin searching for a way to get into the battle, although they never really did. And so there are these soldiers who, by the end of the campaign, because they have been stomping through these, these wild woods and brambles, their clothes are in tatters, they've been cut off from the supply lines for so long that they're not getting the typical... Um, supplies that the government gave to the soldiers, so they're sort of ferreting their way, and they came to an abandoned farmstead where, as Harrison suggested, the, the farmers had skedaddled for fear of being attacked by the Indians, um, or Native Americans, and so they are rummaging around to see what they could find, and they find these scrawny chickens, and so not having had fresh meat for a while, I presume they still had some bacon with them, and we know they do, and they may have still had some ham, they decide to cook the chickens. So these are scrawny, ill-fed chickens who have been scratching around eating bugs, I suppose. And so they prepare them, and they first they try just sort of putting them over the fire, and then they decide, well, that's not going to be very tasty. So then they had found a hog jowl up in the top of one of the um, farm outbuildings, so they rendered that to get a little bit of bacon fat, and then they fried the chicken in that, and Harrison said it was just about as tasty as saddle leather. <laughs> so, uh, well, so, I mean, did they forage out there? I mean, in, amongst their friends whom they're trying to keep Indians away from? 
I, yeah, there is some foraging. They they captured a dove. They had one dove that they made a pot yeah. of soup for for two companies. That was a shadow of the dove. That they, yeah, they it's so so I attempted to emulate that by buying a Cornish game game hen and cooking it in about three gallons of water, and it was surprisingly tasty. You could get some nourishment out of that. But mm. to interpret that that scrawny chicken and the hong jowl, I thought, well, let me just see what happens when you first bake and then you cook a, a chicken with some bacon. It, it's a very nice taste flavor. Hmm. And you had the recipe in here. Did, did they also live on beans as most armies do? I mean, was it Blazing Saddles out there? <laughs> well, it's interesting <laughs> when you look at what, what Lincoln drew from um, the army resources, what he signed for, beans were not among it. I was hmm. surprised. But when he gets to um, the White House and he's spending his uh, evenings out at the Lincoln, what they call the President's Cottage now, which is a National Historic Trust, National Trust for Historic Preservation site. It is just a wonderful place to visit. Um, Lincoln was frequently there alone or alone with Tad. Sometimes Mary was there, but usually in the summers she would escape to go see Robert up in New England. So Lincoln would be there with Tad, and the house where he lived was surrounded by camping soldiers. So of an evening, he would sometimes invite one to come up and play checkers with him on the porch, or he would wander around and, and sit with them for supper and pull up and have a plate of beans and um, some, some bread and molasses. But there's another bean incident which uh, kind of makes you think that, that he, he liked his, his beans. And at one point, he, he's in the White House, and back then, you know, you could just sort of wander in. Nobody stopped you. And so uh, a gentleman brought his nephew in to see the president on some business or other and discovered Lincoln sitting at a table by himself eating a plate of baked beans left over for breakfast, which is a common breakfast food back in the day. So, it, again, it kind of underscores that he liked, I think, enjoyed simple foods that maybe took him back, or they just, as, as with the apple, you know, he said, I will, people should eat foods that agree with them, and apples agree with me. Yeah.